Well, Ray, so are you the LeBron James of forgiveness? <laughs> well, I used to play basketball, and <laughs> I'm a good three-point shooter as well. Good. Even though I'm five feet six, not too tall, but I used to play yeah. good basketball. Well, good. Well, welcome, welcome. Your story is extraordinary. Thank you. Uh, it's not something most of us have experienced, but can you just fill in some of the details? We told it uh, for for the children's sake, and, and now maybe the, uh, the, the PG-14 uh, version. What, yeah. PG-18 version. Yeah, sure. Well, uh, once again, thank you very much for having me at your church. It's a great honor as a Muslim man to be in your church. And uh, once again, thanks for inviting me. Well, um, <clears throat> as I said, that I, I was born in, and raised in an upper middle class family uh, in Bangladesh. And um, I, was, I was very lucky to have a first-rate education at a military boarding school and later on at the Air Force Academy in Bangladesh where I learned to be a pilot. And after graduating as a pilot officer, I did not feel my destiny was there. So I asked for a release and when I got a chance to come to U.S. for higher education, I took it. So temporarily, I left my family and my fiance back home to go to the U.S. to get the education I wanted and to experience the American dream. And uh, I moved to Texas uh, into, right before 9-11. I had a, a high school senior friend living in Dallas that time. He invited me to visit. So from New York City, I came to Dallas a few times, and I loved it. Because as a child back home, I watched a lot of Western movies, <laughs> The Wild Wild West. And Clint Easton was one of my favorite actors. <laughs> it's just like that, right? <laughs> yes, so, well, and I thought, well, now I'll be able to see those pubs, swinging doors. <laughs> the saloons. Saloons, yeah, the, yeah. the boots and buckles. Tie your horse up. Not yeah. Not, yeah. So I was pretty happy to visit Dallas, and I liked it. House, bigger house, not like closet in New York City, my bedroom nice long highways, weather-wise, beautiful weather. So everything was great, I loved it. So finally I moved to Texas, May 2001, and I was working in my friend's gas station uh, in Mesquite, Texas. And I was robbed at a gunpoint. And I could not believe that I would be robbed in my dream country. Hmm. And it was a pretty funny experience, middle of August, 2.30 p.m., I was working in that gas station. A customer walked in, gave me a dollar bill and a soft drink. So he's a customer. And um, when I op opened the cash register, he took out a gun out of his pocket. So I thought he wanted to sell his gun. <laughs> because that gas station was in a poor neighborhood and many times customers used to come with their printers, jewelries, watch, name anything to sell to make quick cash. So I thought this gentleman needs some cash. I asked him how much you're asking for. And he said, give me the money. He wants all of it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I said, but you're not telling me how much you're asking for. And he said, give me the money. I said, but sir, you're not telling me how much you're asking for. I mean, even though I had no intention of buying the gun, but I was curious that how much he's asking. <laughs> On the third time, he cocked the gun and he said, I'll blow up your brain if you don't give me the money. And that time I realized, oh, I'm being robbed. <laughs> so I gave him the money, he left. I was pretty afraid to work in a gas station, but I could not say no to my friend. I, was, I kept working, then 9-11 happened. Ten days after 9-11, uh, it was September 21st, 2001, Friday, I was working in the gas station. And then suddenly this man burst into the store wearing bandana, sunglasses, baseball cap. And he had a double barrel shotgun that he pointed directly at my face. So from my previous robbery experience, I thought it would be another robbery. So I kept all the money on the counter. As soon as he walked in, I said, sir, here's all the money. Take it, but please do not shoot me. I beg for my life. He was not looking at the money. He was looking at me, and I felt a cold air flow through my spine. Why he's not looking at the money? Mm -hmm. And then he mumbled a question, where are you from? And before I could say anything more than excuse me, he shot me from four feet away with the double barrel shotgun. I looked at the ground and I saw the blood was pouring like an open faucet from the right side of my head. 
And I remember myself screaming, Mom, top of my voice. And I felt it like millions of bees stinging my face. And then I heard the big sound, the explosion. And I looked left and saw the gunman was still standing and looking at me. And I thought, if I don't pretend I'm dying, he would shoot me again. So I jumped on the floor. And after a few seconds, he left. I was extremely scared. I went to call 911. I ran to the barber shop next door. And they called 911. I came to the parking lot. I was running from one side to the other for ambulance. I was lucky again. Within a few minutes, ambulance arrived. I was taken to the hospital. I survived. But I got more than 35 pillars on my face. And I'm still carrying 35 plus. So when I touch my face, I can feel it's all all bumpy. I lost a vision because of this gunshot. My, um, I could not pay rent. I was kicked out from my home. I, my father suffered a stroke when he heard his son was shot in the face. My medical bills went up to $60,000. And I called Red Cross to help. And Red Cross told me, you qualified for one week's worth of groceries. The hospital I was taken into discharged me the next day morning because I had no health insurance and it was private hospital. Mm -hmm. So I spent only one night in the hospital and the next morning they said, you know, move on, you, you know, you have to, you know, arrange your follow-up treatments. So long story short, I survived and my parents were asking me to go back, but I decided to stay here and go through this because I did not give up my faith. I did not lose my dream. And I thought something terrible happened. Now, if I go back, I'll be a loser. Mm -hmm. I want to stay here, face it, and see why God saved my life. Mm -hmm. What is the reason behind it? And so your life falls apart. Right. This man just he shot you. Your whole life comes apart. You lose your fiancé, you told me, because of it. And, yes. And, and then you move to, toward forgiveness. You, you, there's a, is it a switch? Is it a, is it a moment? Is it... Do you, does something happen that, that you say, actually, I think I forgive this man? How does it, how does it what, what, tell us that part of the story. Well, uh, forgiveness is not a switch you put on and off. Let's put it this way. For us, it's a process. And as you said, it's not a destination. It's, 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 it's a journey. And in my case, forgiveness did not come like that, switch on and off. I remembered after I was shot, my mom's teachings when I was a little kid, my mom taught me, that when people hurt you, the first thing you should do, put a zipper on your mouth. So since my childhood, I carried a virtual zipper in my pocket. <laughs> Whenever I was hurt, the first thing I did, put it on. So what does she mean? Don't lash out? Don't lash out. Don't lash out. Think through it. Take time. Because once we react, most likely we'll, be, we'll, we'll react with anger, with negative thoughts, with violence. But once you respond, we'll do a better job. And once we take time, will be able to do a better job because we are calm, we are kind of like, you know, think through it. So I remember my mom's teaching and I, I kind of controlled my tongue and I deeply thought about this incident. It already happened. I cannot take it back. But now I have the control, you know, uh, on my reaction, on my response. So first thing I did, I controlled my tongue and I went through a healing process several years. And I, with the, with the help of, with the mercy of God, and with the help of people, Muslims, non-Muslim, I was able to come back to a normal life. And in 2009, I went for a Muslim religious pilgrimage to Mecca. And I spent a month there. And I took my mother with me. And in Islam, it says, if your mother is not happy with you, the heaven's doors are closed for you. <laughs> no matter what you do. I, I, think my, I think my Italian grandmother taught me that too. <laughs> So we're on the same page. <laughs> yeah. So I took my mom there. We stayed there for a month. We prayed. And I deeply thought about the whole incident, my shooting. And I, I deeply realized that, that hate and revenge may bring temporary satisfaction, but they do, not, they do not bring peace or solution to any situation. They only bring more disaster and misery. And I thought about my shooter, Mark Stroman, who was sitting in a death row waiting to be executed. And I, I deeply realized that, that I suffered terribly, but I did not see any value in him suffering as well. 
I looked at him as a human being. I looked at him someone like me. I did not see him as a criminal. I did not see him as a murderer. I thought that his execution will not eradicate hate crimes from this world. We will simply lose a human life without dealing with the root cause. And I thought if he was given a second chance, he might become a better person. Okay. Even from behind bar, he can contribute to society in a positive way. So I thought, I prayed, and I asked God, why did you save my life? I had a promise to you to do something better and dedicate my life for others. Help me to keep my promise. And I thought about my shooter that I need to do something. I forgave him in the past, but it was just a thought. I forgave him. But it's not going to bring anything good to society. I need to do something more so that there's a meaningful something comes out of this. So I came back from Mecca and I thought it was not enough. I have to do something to save the life. So if I'm hearing you right, the, the path of that forgiveness is don't lash out to the zipper. Right. Ponder and then act on, act for the greater good at some level. Exactly. So, so let's, let's play that out a little bit. There's a lot of people here. Right. We probably have all experienced uh, transgressions, okay? Not, most of them not as, as uh, se severe as someone pointing a shotgun at us from four feet. Um, someone cheats us out of money. Uh, someone curses us. Someone uh, does something like that. All the way to uh, the violence you, you experience. There's, a, there's kind of a range there, and we've all experienced that. How do we translate your experience to those kinds of moments that happen almost maybe every week or every day. Uh, and um, are you good at those? Are you better at the small transgressions because of, because of that experience? So that's sort of two directions to right. go. In. Well, uh, this is a very, very good question. Um, I mean, uh, forgiveness is, is a, it's a, it's a powerful human quality, but unfortunately, which is highly misunderstood. When you talk about forgiveness, we think that if, we, if I forgive, means the perpetrator is off the hook. He will not pay for his crime, and I will look weak. That's the first thing comes, there'll be no justice. Forgiveness means he's off the hook, there'll be no justice, and I look weak. But actually it's not. I will tell you that, you know, um, in, in, in my opinion, forgiveness, let's, let's understand first what it is not, then it will make more sense what it is. In my part, in my uh, part, that forgiveness is not denial, minimization, or justification. The crime was done to you. So, if it is not denial, if it is not minimization, if it is not justification of the crime that was done to you, then what it is? Forgiveness is a is a decision that we we take to let the grudge go off from our heart, drop the thoughts of revenge, violence, and all those anger from our heart. And by doing that, we are creating an environment to go through the healing process. We are creating an environment to create bonds, make connection. By doing that, at least we are getting the control of our happiness back to us. The person who hurt us, he's no longer in the charge of our happiness. He's no longer in charge of our thoughts happiness. So if we understand that, that will help us to forgive people. And every situation is unique, you know, uh, and it's limitless. Because I don't know how far you can go in terms of your forgiveness. Because my mother never taught me to go to the European Union Parliament to forgive this guy. But my mother taught me forgive and move on. It will bring something good to you, good to society. And from my personal experience, I can tell because of this forgiveness, I feel happier, I'm healthier, I don't feel that kind of negative energy. When I think about my shooter Markstrom and I get like angry and I feel like I need to take some Xanax or Zoloft to keep myself calm, or my blood boils right away, see his picture and start punching on the picture, I do not do that. So I'm healthier, I'm happier. This forgiveness helped me to boost my kindness and connectedness. Mm. It also helped me to heal the wounds of the violence I went through. So, long story short, I think if we understand that forgiveness is not only for the perpetrator, it's also 
for me, for us, it will help us to lead into that path. So inherent in your, in your thought here is that any forgiveness at any level changes the situation. So someone, I, I actually asked some people to give me some questions, and one question was about whether we can be too forgiving. In other words, if our forgiving is seen as an open door to more abuse, is that, is that right? So how do, you, how do you apply that? Well, you know, um, as I said, the forgiveness benefits both. It, it benefits the, the perpetrator, it also benefits us. So it's not only the, the person who hurt us, he benefits, we also benefit from that. And once we understand what it is and what it is not, then there's no question, can forgiveness and justice walk side by side? If someone does a crime, that person is to pay for that. Because if there is no punishment, no law and, law and order in the society, it will be full of chaos. Mm -hmm. So law and order punishment system is needed to uphold you know, uh, the, uh, and maintain law and order in our, in, our, uh, in our society. But at the same time, we should not let people understand that if you do a crime, you should not pay for that. Mm -hmm. So forgiveness and justice can walk side by side, but we forgive, I mean, I ask you to forgive because it also helps you not only just the perpetrator. Mm -hmm. So justice can take place at the same time, you also get the benefit of forgiveness. Okay. Um, let's go back to your story. So Mark Stroman tries to kill you, he did kill other people. Did you reach out to the families of his victims and did you reach out to his family and, and ha spin that out a little bit? How did that happen? Well, I, I did. Uh, even before Mark Stroman was executed, I, I talked to him for eight seconds on the phone because I was not allowed to talk to him. Some weird Texas law. And uh, in the, during that eight seconds phone conversation, he called me brother and he said he loved me. This is the same human being who shot me in the face for no reason 10 years back before his execution. After his execution, I reached out to his family. I met his daughter a couple of times. I met his son a couple of times in the, in the uh, hospital. And now his son is in prison right now for 14 years. He got out of prison in 2013 after serving eight years. And then he contacted me and he thanked me for, his, for what I did to save his father's life. So we built a bond right there and I visited him in a hospital. He was sick. And then when he found out that there's a trial waiting for him where he will get 20 years for uh, proposition of drugs, so he, his girlfriend called me and said, there is no one to give us some advice. There is no one to talk to us. We feel like we are lost. Can you please help us? Mm -hmm. And I felt terrible. These are also human beings living in our society and there is no one to talk to them. So I reached out to them, tried to help them as much as I could, but this was a pretty tough case. So he took plea. In a set of 20 years, he got 14 years with the hope that when he'll be eligible for parole within two years, then I would be going to the, to the hearing and I will testify, show my support with my friends mm -hmm. so that at least he would be, he'd be able to come out and lead a normal life. So can you imagine that his father shot me in the face, now he's going to prison with the hope that the, I will go to his hearing and testify and show support that he can come out. So I built a bond, make a lot of connection, talk to them, met them, and that was beautiful. We see Islamophobia right. on the rise to some extent, even in our own society. Uh, at, at your mosque, there are people standing out in front uh, of the mosque uh, with guns uh, protesting. Um, what, does that, what does that feel like, and, and does it relate at all to uh, the work you've done so far? Well, you know, I mean, um, it's a good, good topic to talk about. We can talk really long. Yeah, long we only that. have two minutes, <laughs> right. but it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, first of all, it is terrible to see that this is happening in our, in our society and in our city. It's very unfortunate that in 2015 we have, to, we have to see something like that. I mean, we have the right to bear arms, we have the right to carry arms. But the question is, when you go to a, in a place of worship to raise your voice with a gun, is it morally right? If, if I am mad at my Jewish neighbor, is it morally right to raise a Nazi flag, flag and give him a message? I have the right to do whatever I want, but the question is, is it morally right? 
We cannot make law to control each and every behavior. We cannot do that. But the question is, where, where is our moral conscience? Where is the, where our moral compass is pointing? Is it true north or true south? So yes, they have the right to bear arms and come to the mosque and raise their voice. The question is, is it morally right? In an in interview with Al Jazeera, I told a few months back that while you are doing that, please come inside the mosque as well, keeping your arms behind. Come inside the mosque and see what they do, what the Muslims do in the mosque, what kind of prayer they go through, they, you know, they organize. Just make connection, learn about them. That will help to live in a peaceful society. But just standing on the street with, with guns, it's, it's not helping anyone. The children, they ask their fathers, what have you done to these people? They come to our mosque and want to kill us. Because kids are you know, curious. They want to know that what you, did, you guys did, and that's why they are here. And they want to kill us. Just imagine yourself that your kids are asking the same question because some Muslims are standing in front of the street with their guns and sending a message to you. How would you feel? when your kids will ask this question. So it's terrible, it's very unfortunate, but I always tell people that please visit mosque. If you're a Muslim, go to church, go to temple, make the connection, understand each other so that we can live in a peaceful society. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you, Race. Thank you for being here. Very thank welcome. you for taking your story of, uh, in some ways, this global story that became very personal. Uh, and becoming a teacher for the spiritual value of forgiveness. And thank you for being here. Can we thank Thank Grace? you very much. Thank you. thank you all. Thanks, Ray.